You're listening to Investigation Insiders by Integris Intelligence. Welcome back, everyone, for another episode of Investigation Insiders. Today is part two of our discussion about crime going back to the levels it was uh, in the 80s. Uh, Joining me again is uh, Joe Morrow. How are you, Joe? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad to have you. And and of course, our uh, our friend Ed Hartnett is also with us today. How are you, Ed? I'm great. I'm great. I'm well. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, so in episode one, uh, we talked about the 80s um, and I guess early 90s. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it was pretty unsafe during those times, especially in New York City. So today we're going to talk about what it's like now, what's trending, what's happening, and what direction are we heading in. Uh, So uh, before we get started, um, I guess any follow-up comments from either of you? Um, uh, We'll start with you, Joe, and then uh, we'll go to you, Ed, uh, on the last episode. Anything uh, that comes to mind or anything that you didn't say that you want to add on to or anything like that? Uh, You know what? I just left that uh, session just thinking about how it really was back in that day and um, some good memories some not so good memories but I'm glad that things have gotten better after those years but as we yeah. say in this episode things are not so good anymore yeah yeah how about you Ed just uh, you know kind of like I said before uh, you know I'm hoping that that this segment will never be called Back to the Future because, you know, it, it could be trending in that direction, maybe not as severe, but, you know, the ascent uh, out of that, those issues was slow and steady. The decline can be rapid. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried about that. And it's disturbing for me, the city that I love, which I don't live in now, but I, I still, we still frequent the city often. Uh, and the hard work that was done, and the hard work was done Listen, the NYPD gets, gets a lot of the credit, most of the credit, but the hard work was done by the entire law enforcement community, especially post 9-11, uh, you know, federal, state, local, with, and I can't stress this enough, with community support, community partnerships. And I would hate to see all that good work go to waste. And more importantly, I hate to see more people, you know, become victims of, of violent crime. So I'm... I'm I'm worried about the future of the city that I love. Yeah, yeah. no, uh, we're, we're with you. I, I mean, I, I, uh, we're we're with you, and obviously we're 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 talking about it sort of in a bubble about New York City uh, because of our ties to it. But you know, this is really a representation of what's going on across the country. So, before we get uh, started um, on the discussion, I wanted to sort of again start with, with a sort of lighthearted discussion about. The 80s. So, is there a special place that you could think of um, uh, that reminds you of that time that brings back good memories? I'm going to uh, start with you, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I I lived right off of 18th Avenue, and there was a feast every September, St. Rosalia feast, and just I looked forward. We all looked forward to that every year because it's the end of the summer and before school started, and you got to meet up with all your friends. Going to Da Vinci's Pizza, Vegas Diner, Jan's, all these popular places that was just the norm for everybody. But that feast was funny because behind the scenes, you know, there were ties to organized crime. But we were just enjoying all the the perks of it and and the, the food and the atmosphere of it. But behind the scenes, I'm sure money was being made by uh, organized crime families. Sure. I, I think we can all look back on certain certain places and uh, think about, wow, you know what? I didn't realize that was going on also um, while I was eating my uh, uh, Cheetos, you know what I mean? So, um, (laughs) that police. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, (laughs) What, what about, what about uh, you, Ed? What, what, what do you think about what, what, is there a place that's fond in your heart? Yeah, but first I I gotta, I gotta uh, go on about uh, something Joe said about those feasts. I, I was a brand new sergeant. And back then, when you made sergeant, uh, in theory, they put you in one command 
in the, I was in the Bronx at the time, they would put you in one command for six months. Ideally, you make all your mistakes, and then they put you in your permanent command. So my first six months was in the 40, and of course I made many more mistakes after that, but uh, they put me in the 48th precinct in the Bronx, which covered the Arthur Avenue section, uh, and I worked one of those feasts uh, two weeks straight. Uh, there was some characters like out of a movie, and out of a bad movie in some cases, uh, but you, to Joe's point, you knew even as a as a baby sergeant, uh, and a, you know a, a cop graduated out of Harlem and wound up in the Bronx again. Uh, I said, you know, yeah, these guys are these guys have their own program going here, uh, so I can <laughs> I can I can identify. And in theory, we were basically protecting them, which was kind of ironic. But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but one thing one thing that that brings me back a bit is. I'm a Yankee fan, and when you know when you could go to the stadium, uh, you know if you took the Deegan, uh, it was a rookie mistake because the Deegan's going to be packed with cars. So I know the Bronx pretty well, so you could fly right down the Grand Concourse in your car and get to the stadium in record time. And a big chunk of that concourse, south of Fordham Road, going right to the Cross Bronx, was my precinct, the 46th precinct, where I was a sergeant. I have some fond, fond memories of the precinct I was in as a cop. Uh, the demographics were different. But, you know, same thing, conditions, tough, tough neighborhood, a lot of drugs, a lot of crime, a lot of poor people just trying to make ends meet. Uh, but when I drive down the concourse, even to this day, I think back fondly of the people I worked with. Sadly, some of them are no longer with us. Some of them got, got hurt in the job. Some of them have sadly passed away from 9-11 related uh, illnesses, et cetera. But I go through that neighborhood thinking with a sense of accomplishment that, you know, we were there in the craziest of times. And now the neighborhood, while it's not perfect, it's so much better. So I, I do get a little nostalgic when I drive, through, drive, drive down the concourse going to the stadium. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. Um, I, I mean, even as you're describing it, it's just kind of funny. I mean, you know, just the, anyone that's experienced, and I'm sure people, as, as they listen to us on this episode, they're going to have their own memories and things like that. You know, what sticks out to me, one of the things, and, and Joe, you got you sent me that meme before uh, we got on this call um, um, about what's the difference. What, what, what was the what was the meme? I, I want you to pull that up while I tell this story. But we spent a lot of time outdoors, right? Um, and sports was the biggest part of sort of being a child at that time, right? And so right. I miss you know, uh, playing baseball and playing football and stickball and handball and everything else with my friends, with my cousins, with everyone else. So that that really the parks and, and being outdoors on the street is what I really think about when I when I think about that period in my life. Uh, but, Joe, do, were you able to pull up the, the the meme that you sent me that 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 talked about the difference between then and now? Yeah, yeah. So it says, my kids asked me what it was like growing up in the 80s. So I took their phones away and turned the internet off. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so the... Uh, and, you and think about true. it, it's like, it's totally true. Because then they would be forced to just, okay, let me see who's out. Let me see what else I can do. Get outside and do something. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And, and you know, my mom, just uh, so, uh, for you, for your information, was was the one, you know, there's the groups, like every group of friends and kids had like different characters. Everyone played a different role, right? I was the kid that my mother, when I didn't show up at uh, home on time, she was she was the one calling everybody's house looking for me. So... <laughs> So anyway, uh, it's, it's fun to talk about that before we get into this sort of heavier discussion about where we are today. So Ed, I'm going to, again, pass it to you and, and Joe and I will, will comment or ask questions from time to time. But so what's it like today? T tell me in your opinion, having been in the positions that you were in, tell me about what it's like today. Uh, what what are some of the, I think all of us have the same feeling that it might be heading back, maybe not as bad like you mentioned, but maybe heading back towards that direction. What are some of the red flags? What are, what are the things that make you feel that way? Well, I mean, if we, if we kind of talk about where we may be going, we've already kind of touched on where we're coming from or where we came from. And I, and I did mention before, you know, the transition, the, the, the metamorphosis, for want of a better term, that took place uh, 
when when Bill Bratton came on board with with a guy like Jack Maple and, and folks that anybody out there that that doesn't know Jack Maple, Google him. Uh, the man was a genius. Sadly, he passed away young. Uh, the architect of of all the crime reduction strategies that followed, with, working with good people like Chief Lou Anamone and and John Timney, the late great John Timney. Uh, they basically said Bratton came in, and I just I just had breakfast with him the other day, uh, and he still got it. He's still to me along with Ray Kelly, the gold standard of policing in this country. Uh, but he came in and basically said, we're going to take the streets back. And this was unheard of. This kind of, this kind of talk, this brash talk was unheard of. You, what are we going to take the streets back? We didn't know we lost them. Well, we certainly did lose them. Uh, and he went, they went block by block, street by street, precinct by precinct. And Bratton and his team made it clear that they instituted CompStat, which is the, uh, the uh, penultimate accountability mechanism in policing. Everything gets measured. Everything gets done. Uh, you have to have some kind of plan. A bad plan is better than no plan. If you went down to CompStat with no plan, you had a problem. Uh, if you did well in crime reduction as a precinct commander, you got promoted. So they made it a career path. If you were a good crime fighter, if you were plugged into your community, you got things done. So steadily from, from mid-90s till now, so recently anyway, the numbers went down. And it's not all about numbers because we always remember that every number has a victim attached to it. But we went from 2,200 murders in the early 90s down to I think it's now in the 300s. Uh, and, the, and the other major crimes, rape, robbery, burglary, grand larceny, auto theft, felony assault, they all went down precipitously over the years because of CompStat and because of that accountability that comes with CompStat. So again, the, the current police commissioner, uh, Dermot Shea, uh, I always tell people I'm officially old because Dermot was one of, one of my lieutenants when I was a chief. So <laughs> when one of your lieutenants becomes the police commissioner, you are officially old, my friend. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he's an outstanding crime fighter. He's an outstanding strategist. He has vision. The, the pre- police commissioner before him, Jim O'Neill, is an old friend. Same way. These, are, these guys are all in the Bratton mold. When Bratton came back the second time, uh, he, he recommended Jim O'Neill take over and then Dermot Shea take over. So... But, you know, they can only do so much. The police department can only do so much because of the conditions that are now uh, in place. Uh, bail reform uh, was in place in other states, and the powers that be in New York State thought bail reform would be a good thing here. Uh, in my view, it was put in, it was rushed. It wasn't uh, a lot of, in, there wasn't a lot of input from law enforcement executives, police, you know, police experts. Uh, so the people that, the, vi- the very violent people that would normally be in jail uh, were released without bail. And then many of them uh, commit the same crime and they get arrested again and they get released again. So bail reform is a, is a major factor in, in the crime increase and violent crime increase in the city and throughout the country. Secondly, uh, another fact that is involved and doesn't get talked about much is something called the uh, 15-day discovery rule. Uh, basically what that means is when someone gets arrested, the, the, the cops and the prosecutors must turn over all evidence within 15 days. Uh, and that includes the names, addresses, and phone numbers of victims, uh, possibly who, you know, and witnesses. So people are less inclined to, uh, to cooperate with the police because they know within two weeks, the bad guy's going to know exactly who they are and where they live. Those two factors alone are causing, you know, major issues uh, as far as crime increases. Secondly, you know, you know the, the post-George Floyd uh, experience, uh, obviously what happened to George Floyd was horrendous and a, and a stain on law enforcement in this country. Uh, the reaction after that, uh, you know, blaming every cop for the actions of one cop in, in Minnesota. Uh, but again, it, 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 it forced the cops to be less inclined to uh, take proactive action. Uh, now they're worried about not only their, their career, possibly even, you know, worried about being incarcerated themselves. So these things are all kind of in the, in the pot, making things go, I think, in the wrong direction. Sure, sure. And, and look, you, you and I talk about this, uh, you know, often. And, and um, I think you would agree that uh, by, by no means are, are, are you saying um, that there's a single solution that's absolute, that's skewed in any direction. So meaning that there has to be changes across the board that's going to make this all better, not just 
in one area, right? Yeah, and you know, it's ironic too that you know some of the loudest voices uh, that 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 are highly or hypercritical of the police uh, don't don't live or work or visit the neighborhoods they're speaking of. I mean, I've been at community meetings in many between you know New York City and Yonkers. I was in many many church basements in the evening at community meetings and school cafeterias and uh, church halls and uh, folks in those neighborhoods, especially the neighborhoods that are having some tough issues with crime and violence, uh, they're not, they don't want this kind of policing, frankly. Most of them, the majority of those folks, they don't want, they don't want brutal police policing. They don't want disrespectful policing. They certainly don't want racially motivated or racially biased policing, but they want policing. They want, they want that guy that's, that's on the corner drinking beer and urinating on the lamppost, they want him gone. They want him off that corner. They want something done about that. They don't want to have to walk down the street with their stroller and their baby in a carriage and have to walk around, you know, four guys that are playing their radio loud and, and, uh, and acting disrespectful. Those folks don't want that. Uh, and I think I can speak for, for many of them, if not most of them, that they want respectful policing. They want community policing, you know, which is a, sometimes an overused term. Uh, but they don't, they don't want, you know, the police to be disengaged. They want an engaged police department. And sadly, there's not as many people speaking for them. They just, these other folks are speaking probably from a political agenda or whatever kind of agenda, but they're not speaking for the folks that I know that, that live in those neighborhoods. Right, right, right. And, and so uh, going back to, I guess, um, uh, the points that you made about the bail reform, uh, the 15 day rule, things like that. Right. So, you know, I, I talk to um, police officers that are currently on the force and, and they talk about that a little bit as far as, you know, how, you know, sometimes, in fact, this is a true story uh, where, where a guy that I used to work with, he, he's saying, look, you know, it's it's very difficult to even arrest people because sometimes by the time we arrest them, we bring them back to the precinct, fill out the paperwork. Oftentimes that person is out before I even finish the paperwork. Right. And mm -hmm. regardless of of of, uh, of, you know, how serious or not serious the crime is sometimes. And um you know, that's that's a little bit scary because those are the things going back to what this discussion started from is now the person comes back out. And we've heard this a lot in the news where the person may come back out and and commit another crime. And there there have been people that, you know, it's almost like a joke where they're saying they've been arrested like 20 times in the last 20 days. Right. And they're out every single day. That sort of gives me the, you know, the gets me back to like that lawlessness that we talked about where someone who is a repeat offender um, is is out because they and, and they know they could go out the same day uh, that they're out, commit another crime, go back in, um, come back out, do it again. And, and, and that brings me back to the feeling. I mean, uh, do you guys agree with that? I, how do you feel about that? I'd agree with that. And I think that's what uh, makes some people hesitate reporting because if they're found out that they were the one who called them in, they're kind of like a target. They're afraid somebody's going to come after them because they're the ones who ratted them out. So because you know they're getting out unless it's you know a major crime, but they're, getting, they're coming out and nobody wants that. So I think that kind of stuff just makes us continue this way. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the word on the street is, you know, snitches get stitches. And, and that's, that's a sad reality. Uh, but, you know, even, even part of, you know, I talked about this whole renaissance, for want of a better term. Part of that was, and, we've, and we're, you know, it's slipping away now, is, is assertive quality of life enforcement. And, and again, at times, and I'll, I'll admit it, at times it was overused. At times it was outright abused. But when it's done right, and most of the time it was done right, uh, the, in the transit system, for example, it's, just, it's funny, I was talking to Bill Bratton the other day, as I mentioned, uh, when he came on, there was, there was a lot of really violent crime. He was initially the transit chief, people forget, before he became the New York City Police, Com uh, police Commissioner. Uh, the subways were out of control, murders, all kinds of mayhem going on, and they started, they started enforcing fair beating. Uh, and there's a myth going around now that, you know, most of the people uh, jumping the turnstile or, or sneaking on the train are poor people that don't have the subway fare. 
if you ask any transit cop, especially back then, uh, most of the people that they arrested for jumping the turnstile had 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks in their pocket. So that's, that's a myth for the most part. Uh, but they started enforcing that because they said a lot of these folks were coming on the train to commit crime. So they were stopping them right, right at the gate. And then, of course, they're arresting them for the fair beat. They find out they have open warrants. They had weapons. They had drugs. So that kind of attention to those small details prevented things from getting out of control. Again, the beer drinking, the public urination, the weed smoking on the corner, the loud radios. We all have anecdotes. Anybody that was around then, we all have anecdotes of a little thing we did that led to a bigger thing. That kind of stuff, attention to those small details, the broken windows theory, which gets a yeah. bum rap now, but the broken windows theory absolutely, absolutely was part of the, the turnaround that the city made. Absolutely. Um, that's on the, the law side, the, the things that sort of are contributing to sort of the decline in the quality of life, the, uh, the criminal activity, the increase in criminal activity and things like that. So there has to be some balance struck here between, you know, lawful policing, like like you mentioned um, before, as far as um, engaging properly with the community, uh, not not uh, you know improperly, and you know things like that. How how do we strike a balance? How how do you think we we can strike a balance here between all the things that are up in the air? Obviously, one of the things today that's different is that we're not in that same environment that we were before, right? Um, so I, I think that the methodology used by all parties involved, the laws, everything needs to be adjusted so that we're accounting for today, right? Do you have any thoughts on what, what people should be thinking about and what would make a difference um, in terms of not continuing to move in this wrong direction? I'm seeing, I'm, I'm hoping it's not, it's not gonna continue, I'm seeing that, somewhat of a trend in the, the disengagement or the slipping away of the, the public-private partnerships that got us to where we were uh, in a good way. The, you know, at the corporate level, the corporate security level, you know, the, the not as much of a, of a c continuing communication between, in, in, the, in the New York City, for example, in the, with the precinct commander and the community affairs officer and the crime prevention officer. Uh, those, those relationships are critical to to moving forward, and and I kind of I'm kind of sensing that some of the some of the corporate folks might be saying, what's the use? You know, things are out of control now. Now with COVID, you know, more people working from home. It's going to stay like that for a while. I I I would I would strongly recommend to anyone I speak to of my my colleagues in the private sector to to keep up those contacts because I, I I'm hoping things can get better, but they can't get better. If we if we get away from the good things we've done in the past, sure. No, I I, I would agree with that. I I, I think that um, I I see that sort of same sentiment in certain circles, uh, and and I agree with you. I think that you have to keep it going. You have to continue to push on forward and and really um, hope that things get better. And if not, at the very least, you'll be informed, better informed, and be able to get information and and um, be prepared in the event that you know things get worse or perhaps better. So I, I think those are all good points. And then what do you say to like uh, having been a police officer for as long as you were, having held both, you know, you, you were a police officer on the street, you were a sergeant, you were a lieutenant, you went up through the ranks and held the very highest level in a police department, right? What do you what do you say to police officers uh, out there as far as you know doing their jobs every day and and you know not letting things like what happened to George Floyd happen to someone else? You know, it's again, uh, you know, I, I use a I use a a guy like a, a model like like Bill Bratton. You know, we I, I do uh, some police consulting with him as part of his team, uh, so I do get to I do get my police fix, so to speak. Uh, you know, talking to cops, talking to bosses in the street, talking to chiefs, and uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, you know, keep, you hold your head up. You know, we're, it's, it's a it's a proud and noble profession. Uh, you know, don't let this get you down. Uh, yes, you're going to be on camera all the time, and you know what? That's why I I became a convert several years ago to body cameras. I was I, I did some police consulting projects in cities where body cameras were kind of thrown at the cops uh, without good policy, without good equipment, maybe without good training. 
uh, it was done in an onerous way. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is messed up. You know, I, I'm not sure I would, I would enjoy this, but you know, now I'm seeing the positive sides of body cameras is, uh, you know, you don't just get one side of the story now. You don't just get the 10 second viral YouTube clip. Uh, the body camera now is capturing the entire incident. When the general public sees that footage, they get to see what this cop is dealing with. They get to see this young male or female officer engaged in, in absolute madness at times and trying to be restrained and trying to do their job. So the general public gets to see just exactly what this cop is going through. And you know what also a good side benefit of body cameras is? Yes, there are a small minority of police officers who do bad things, who do stupid things, or are knuckleheads. And uh, I'll use the clinical term knucklehead. Uh, so it does keep those small number of officers in line where they might not be prone to do something stupid or illegal or disrespectful or unprofessional because they know they're on body cam. So again, just to answer the question, I, I know it's tough to be a cop these days, but I, I'm holding out, I'm holding a good thought for the police. And I think that, you know, they'll get through this and it'll just evolve. The policing is, is a, it's a profession that evolved, I think, better than any other profession in many, many ways. We're also probably more self-analytical than, than any other profession. I can't think of any other profession that, that looks at itself as much and, and strives to improve as much as policing. Uh, I, you know, again, nothing against lawyers and doctors and stuff, but, and also the other professions, they don't get input from the public on, on how to improve. So, right. uh, Again, I tell cops now, it's, you know, it's still a good profession. It's still a, it's still a, a noble pursuit and, you know, be safe. And, and one last thing too is departments now are, in, are employing, and I think it's a very good thing, as part of their use of force policies, they're employing uh, statutes that call for duty to intervene. And basically, and listen, it was always done informally. Whenever you saw a cop maybe go, going a little overboard or getting too excited, you pulled them, you pulled them off, you, you maybe at a demonstration, put him in the back for a while. You didn't let him get upset. You didn't let him do something that might get him in trouble. We always did it, but now it's becoming memorialized. It's becoming mandatory. So duty to intervene is a good thing in policing because it now requires that if, if somebody like the George Floyd incident, if somebody's doing something like that and you know that it's wrong, uh, you have to do something now or you'll be held liable. And it sounds onerous. I believe that it's a very good thing, a very good step for policing moving forward. Sure, sure. I and, agree. And, I like that. Yeah. I mean, from your, so like the, the parts of what I'm picking up from what you're saying is that, you know, on the, on the police side, right, um, in terms of, look, a lot of the laws, you know, laws, when they change, um, maybe they're a good intention, right? Um, but once you put it into practice, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, then you work out all the, you find out all the sort of holes in it, right? And then the idea is to continue making adjustments, I think, to make it work for society that it's meant to govern, right? And so um, going back to, again, the fact that, you know, we are seeing an increase in crimes, we are seeing quality of life, we are avoiding like what you discussed, um, broken windows policing, we are, we are, we are not, we're getting away from all those things. So, you know, it, it sounds like just from everything you're saying that we need to continue to uh, work towards that balance where, you know, police are acting appropriately, respectfully, like you said, over and over again, um, and, and, and firmly in terms of what they need to do. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 everyone else that's putting the things uh, in place around that uh, also continue to adjust and make changes to, to make it work for all involved, right? Yeah, you know, it, two good points, two, two points just to make on the, on the well-intentioned piece. Yeah. Uh, bail reform, there's a classic example. Bail reform did need some improving. It did need some reform. It did need some improvement. The whole bail system needed to be right. looked at, analyzed, revised, modified. Uh, there's something wrong, and I, I'm not I'm not a bleeding heart, but I I, I think I'm a compassionate person. Uh, there's something wrong with a kid, you know, 18 year old kid sitting in Rikers Island for two and a half years uh, on a crime that ultimately he might be found not guilty of, but because his family couldn't come up with bail money. 
I gotta right. say, you know, thank God, you know, I, I, uh, my mother would have killed me if I committed a crime, but uh, then she would have went to jail. But uh, I, you know, if, if I, my, my family couldn't afford, you know, that kind of bail. If I was, if I was caught up in something stupid like that, and I wound up getting arrested, and I, I'd be sitting in Rikers Island for two years. So, so bail, bail reform, def, bail needs to be looked at. Again, it was done in a hurried manner. It was done to me again without input from all the, the parties involved. Uh, that that's one example. Another example of something well intentioned and, and it's going to work eventually is is what they call the raise the age law, where New York State and I think North Carolina were the only two states in the whole country that that had juvenile that that considered sixteen year olds adults. The rest of the country, you're eighteen. If you're under eighteen, you're a juvenile. So to me, that that cried out for some kind of reform. But you know, it's now it's now they're stuck with trying to figure out. What do we do with these 16 and 17 year olds? Some of them who are already hardened criminals. Some of them were just dopey kids that, that made one mistake in their life. So it's now been kind of rushed about, rushed through. But you know, those are two examples I think of, of things that initially are well-intentioned that could have been done better, but, but now they're kind of like scrambling on, on how do we fix it? How do we modify things back so it's not gonna go out of control? Yep. And, and, and I think I think it's important that, you know, again, people people recognize that, you know what, it's it's not working uh, the way it was intentioned uh, uh, to, to work. And we need to uh, continue to make adjustments so it does work. And look, I, I mean, from the police side, I think that you would agree it's the same. Like you mentioned before, there are obviously police officers uh, or people uh, in those types of roles that, you know, don't do things the way that they're taught. Don't do things the way that they're they should be doing. And um, uh, I know from speaking to you and others that that stuff that the police department and the powers that be within the police department are constantly working on to improve. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I, you know, there's, there's there's a lot of oversight now. It's just just speaking from the NYPD perspective. And frankly, I thought you know for the most part. Uh, we police ourselves very well. I mean, in some cases, the NYPD discipline system is quite draconian. It's quite harsh. Uh, but you know what? It, it serves to keep keep folks in line. And uh, again, you know, some of the less informed think that the cops do whatever the hell they want, whenever they want, wherever they want. And it's just not the case. There's a lot of controls in place. Again, having done police consulting all over the country, the, the supervision model, the level of supervision, the level of oversight in the NYPD in most cases, second to none. Okay. I believe well, that. I mean, nobody yeah. wants, you don't want the, your fellow cops making you look bad because it, it brings everybody down. So you want that. No, no. I mean, you a horrible, Joe, jo, you're right on the money. A horrible example in my career was uh, the Abner Louima case. Uh, I mean, this, this gentleman was arrested. Uh, there was some kind of brawl in the street. He was arrested and, and one of the officers wind up uh, sodomizing him. I mean, right. to me, that was the low point in my career that I had. To, I mean, the very next week, I was a deputy inspector, uh, fairly new, and I'm I'm policing a demonstration of of people expressing their outrage, and uh, and you know, we were ashamed. We were ashamed. Yeah. None of us thought that happened. We said this guy is making this up. Uh, no way he did that. The the uh, the perpetrator in this case, the officer. Uh, his father was, I think, a retired agent. He was on radio every day, you know, proclaiming his son's innocence. And then, then the officer admits that he did it. I mean, yeah. that was a heart. That was a that was a, a stain on the New York City Police Department. That that, in some ways, always going to be there. Right. Uh, and I know that kind of shame that brings to the officer. So, I mean, none of us obviously want that. And that was, it was hard to live that down. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, obviously, I, I think we could we could just keep talking about the, the, all the all the the topic and all the surrounding topics, uh, sort of uh, for for a very long time. But to I guess to conclude and 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 to give our listeners some some thinking and talking points and um, you know uh, takeaways from I guess this episode and the one we started with, which all boiled, all circled around the fact that, you know, the 80s and the 90s before there was a uh, uh, real change in, in crime here in New York City and throughout the country uh, in, in a positive way, 
uh, that it was pretty bad. And, and, and the fear here is that we start going backwards and we start going back to that type of criminal activity, uh, maybe not the same way, but in different ways. And, um, you know, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like it might be getting back to. Obviously, I think we all agree it's not like that today, but certainly even going in that direction is, is a scary thing. And so, I mean, again, it's it, to me, it sounds like everyone needs to continue talking and having real discussions about all of these things and transparent discussions and people that are actually living and working and, and, and um, dealing with all the different issues that need to sort of continue talking and, and finding a good balance to not only um, policing and treating the whole community fairly, but also on the flip side, allowing the police to do what they do to kind of make sure that we don't go back into that direction. What, what, what would you guys yeah. say to that? Yeah, you know, Fahad, I, 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 one thing I'd, I'd like to say is that, uh, I mean, some of this that's going on now, some of this decline, for want of a better term, has to be laid at the doorstep of COVID. I understand that. I mean, that's, that's been, you know, obviously a, a global issue. And, and in cities across America, there, some of this stuff, these increases, these declines in, in, in quality of life can be attributed to COVID. However, uh, I think sometimes that gets overdone, overplayed. Uh, a lot of this stuff is happening because of all the issues we talked about. And, and in New York City, just using New York City as an example, the impact on, on the business community, you know, and, and by extension, the theaters, the restaurants, investment, uh, tourism, uh, all that stuff. I mean, nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to do business. Nobody wants to raise a family. Nobody wants to visit or go to school in a place that's unsafe. You know, it all starts with public safety. And, and, and uh, if you have a sense of fear and disorder, you're going to go elsewhere. So, you know, that's, that's one of my big concerns, that the city is going to decline because people just do not feel safe, you know, being there, raising their family, going to work, going to school, whatever there. And they'll either go somewhere else or they'll stay home. And the city will just spiral downward. And, and then it takes a long time to come back. Yeah, it almost put us all in like a desperate state. So people are desperate. They're not getting their income. They're not living life the way they used to. They're stuck in the house. I mean, people, you know, out of desperation and fear, like you said, people just make poor choices. Yep. No. I mean, Joe, uh, look at look at me and you, Joe. Look at me and you. Joe. We're we're stuck talking to Fahad. I mean, look at that. <laughs> Well, that's that's one way to, that's one way to end this the uh, <laughs> and the one thing is I, I, I do believe in, in people I believe in um, the resiliency of New York the country everything like that 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 we will find a solution but that's not going to come by sitting around waiting for uh, someone else to do something I, I think I think everybody needs to play an active role and really work together on finding a solution that that's going to make sense for um, as many people as possible. Well said. We came back from 9-11. We'll, we'll come back from this, but it's a, it's a long haul. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate um, uh, you joining us, Ed, for this discussion and, and obviously your experiences and your career and everything like that. I think it'll be meaningful for our audience to hear from you uh, directly. So thank you so much for being on. Thank you, Joe, also for participating in this discussion. It's been very interesting, obviously. And thank you all for tuning in. Please send your comments and questions to info at integrisintel.com. If you'd like to connect with Ed, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll also put his LinkedIn profile in the description of the link. Um, so thank you for joining us, guys. Thank you. Thank you for Don't forget to follow us. We are on LinkedIn and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube.